Hello, everyone. Are you there? Hello. Hey, I barely see you. So it's one more presentation before lunch break. So please stay with me. Um, let's start with some presentation. So my name is Laurent Picard. As you can hear, I'm French. I live in Paris. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at Picard Paris. I'm a developer advocate for Google. Um, I joined them about two years ago. And before that, I was an ebook pioneer. Um, I've worked for 17 years in the ebook industry. Uh, I was one of the first makers of the first ebook devices, so it was a big brick of one kilogram, and that was back in 1999 already. So, um, and as you can guess, I've done a lot of embedded software development. Eventually, the devices got connected, they got Wi Fi. We got e paper, that was the real revolution. And so eventually, I went to touch cloud technologies. And so now I'm focusing on cloud technologies, Python also a little bit, and as a matter of course, uh, on machine learning also. Machine learning is everywhere. So I'd like to know a little bit about you in the audience. I barely see you, but uh, who is a, a developer in the audience? Uh, let's say, yeah, about 60% of the attendees. Okay, so um, I will uh, move on. My, my, my goal today is to show you uh, what you can do without being an expert in machine learning. And I very much like to start with this quotation from Arthur C. Clarke, because even today, whenever I see something new done with machine learning, my first reflex is like I'm seeing some magic trick, right? But as we know, we can scratch a little bit. This is just technology, okay? And my goal today is to show you uh, that with many examples. What is a conference? What, why are you here today? Because of human learning. You're going to see presentations, and out of that, you will take away information, right? And machine learning is exactly the same. You have data as an input, and you want to extract information out of that and ideally get ideas or get very uh, precise insights that will be useful for you. How does it work? So that was a field, deep learning uh, specifically, that started in the 80s. So AI is even older than that. And the experts have imagined a way to mimic the way we think our brain works with neural networks. You know, we have synapses in our brains, even in our stomach. Um, and for that, they've been using lots of examples. I have three kids. My kids learn most from examples too, right? And the result is surprising. We managed to solve problems we were not able to solve before, with, thanks to machine learning. And as a matter of fact, also, last week, uh, there was the, Turing, uh, the Alan Turing Award uh, that was given to three researchers. It, ha it happens that those were the guys in the 80s, the three researchers who started working on neural networks. Uh, the Alan Turing Award is like the Nobel Prize for computi computer science, right? So these researchers, almost 40 years later, now are, are congratulated for their work. Uh, you can see the results uh, in many, many different places. So how does it work? Uh, on this specific example. So we all like to show cats and dogs, right? So if you want to detect cats and dogs, then you will need a data set which is cats and dogs pictures, for instance. You will give them as inputs, and you will give the result you're expecting. So here, for instance, a cat, I'm expecting a cat. The experts, thanks to this mechanism, they build a neural network with connections, with a lot of mathematics behind. And they will train a model with lots of samples. Once you've done that, this is the training phase, then you can use the neural network to make predictions, to make detections. For instance, you can present a new picture, and it will use the connections in the neural net and make a prediction, and it will tell you maybe this is a dog, and I'm 87% sure about it. Okay. To give you an idea about the usage of machine learning at Google, those are the number of projects that contain um, a machine learning model. Uh, and for a few years, you see, this is exponential use at Google. 
And you can see that in some applications. So for instance, G in Gmail, when you start to write a sentence, it proposes you to end the sentence. Uh, the funny thing is that sometimes I say, yeah, yeah, thank you. It is a better sentence that, than what I wanted to write initially. Uh, also, you can have quick uh, answers to emails, three suggestions, right? And you can just, in one click or two clicks maybe, uh, answer right away. This is thanks to machine learning. If we take a step back, um, as of today, there are three ways we all can benefit from machine learning. I'm talking about building solutions, right? Building smarter solutions with machine learning. Of course, there's machine learning per se, the hardcore machine learning. There are experts, there will, there will always be experts. We need them. And this is where the innovation is coming from. Okay? They've been working for decades on AI on algorithms, on models. So we have the theory, and for a little bit l less than 10 years, now we have the computing power. So this is why it is working now, right? On the other side, we have developers. So I'm a, a developer, right? And developers, without a any knowledge in AI, can use ready-to-use machine learning models, and they are available as APIs. So an API is you make a web request, with the data you have, you get a response back, right? Uh, this is a JSON response. So they're ready to use. And for about one year, we're filling a gap, or we, I mean, the, the machine learning industry, with AutoML techniques. So AutoML techniques are just in between to fill a gap where you don't, maybe you don't have many experts in your company or there will never be enough experts, right? But AutoML techniques will allow you to build custom neural networks, custom models for your own needs. And in the presentation today, I propose you to have a, look, a deep look at what you can do with the APIs and with, with AutoML, OK? And there will be a live demo, so don't feel asleep. OK, let's start. So first of all, the, the machine learning APIs, so we call them building blocks. They are, they are like Lego bricks, right? You can take one brick and integrate it in your own solution pretty easily. So I talked about input and information. So as input, you can provide text, images, videos, uh, and speech, right? And as an output, what you get is information, or in some cases, you get your input that has been transformed. OK? So I will be showing you some examples with Google Cloud machine learning solutions, but keep in mind that this is a very extensive family. Other companies are, are doing that. Uh, Microsoft and IBM, for instance, are doing a great job. There are other companies dedicated to some parts of this. I believe we have something very intensive. A few years ago, uh, our CEO said, Google must be an AI first company, and, and it, it shows, right? OK, so my favorite API, for personal reasons, is the vision API. So this is a vision model. You provide pictures. Uh, why is it my favorite? Um, when I was finishing my studies in the 90s, I learned how to detect something out of, out of a picture, right? How to extract information for, from picture. And at the time, we were trying to detect edges. OK, you know, with the contrast, with convolution matrices, we were detecting edges in pictures. And it was OK. It worked in some cases, but as soon as we would use new pictures, it stopped to work. It was very frustrating. And machine learning is the, sh the solution. So we can detect a lot of stuff uh, out of pictures. Let me show you a few examples. So I, I, I told you I live in Paris. So if I see this picture, in a snap, I say, yeah, this is Paris. Uh, there's an Eiffel Tower. This is Paris. I recognize that in 100 milliseconds. The Vision API is able to tell me the same thing, OK? It's also able to give me the GPS location. So OK, no big deal. Everybody here, I guess, would uh, tell the same. So I took another picture with still an Eiffel Tower, but this is not Paris. For someone living in Paris, like me, yeah, there's an Eiffel Tower, but this picture is weird. This is not Paris. The Vision API tells me that this is Las Vegas. This is the Paris 
hotel and casino in Las Vegas, where they, they had a reproduction of the Eiffel Tower. So here it works well, and I wouldn't be fooled, but I wouldn't be able to tell this is Las Vegas, okay? Uh, it's even telling me where the picture is coming from, probably, or where a very similar picture is available. So I try to see the limits, you know, of the vision model. So this time I took another picture from the web. I flipped it, I zoomed in, I slowed it a little bit, skewed it, sorry, skewed it, uh, zoomed in and cropped it, so this is nowhere uh, close to the original picture. But here are someone living in Paris. In a snap, I would say this is, yeah, this is Paris, but this is still actually Las Vegas. And the vision model is able to tell me that this is still Las Vegas. So this is where, this is an example of where the, the machine learning model is doing better than myself. So pretty interesting. It's not always the case, right? It is far from, from perfect. So if it's also able to detect objects in the picture. So this is a very hard field. Uh, we are getting very nice results. Of course, it will tell you whether there's a car, a bicycle, a person in a picture. But here, for instance, so all the other pictures are coming from the Tolkien universe as, as a tribute to Tolkien. So this is a picture from New Zealand. Uh, it's called Hobbiton, the place where the Lord of the Rings movie was shot, right? And here, the vision model tells me that there's a plant, 60% sure about it. It's giving me the location of the plants. There's a window. So actually, the window is a door, but for a hobbit. And also, it's able to detect that there's a house around it. Okay, so this is very hard to do. Uh, and we are getting the first results of ob object detections like this. Likewise, if it's not able to give you the exact location, um, it can describe you the picture with labels. So this is another picture from Hobbiton. And here it's telling me, okay, this is about nature, tree, it's a photography. Uh, there's a sky, there's grass, everything. That's correct. Um, but also, it's able to tell me that there's a sign, a block of text here. It's actually written with a fancy font. Not elfish, but something, you know, the vowels have... So this is something that Tolkien uh, imagined with uh, the elfish alphabet, so the vowels have little stresses above them. So here, it's, give, it's telling me this is English text. It's giving me the, the words, so it's right, but there's a mistake here. So of course, there shouldn't be a stress above on, and there should be a space between except and on. So here, we would automatically fix that by our knowledge, knowing that this is most probably English and so on. But the interesting thing with machine learning is that uh, four months ago, I, did, uh, I, I tried the same and it was making two mistakes. So machine learning models, they are learning all the time. So they improve over time, right? So maybe in a few months, I hope, uh, it will not make the same mistake again. Likewise, if there are faces in the picture, it will tell you the location. Uh, the location of everything, the eyes, the nose, uh, ears, and everything. It will give you the location of the face in 3D. And also, we'll try to detect sentiments on the face. So here, for instance, it's telling me that the face is likely angry. And as we know, Gollum is always angry, so that, that, that had to be true. Okay. And likewise, if there are famous uh, things or persons in the picture, it will try to detect them. So on this example, I took a rare picture of Tolkien. It has been used only once by a Spanish newspaper, and still it's able to describe me this picture as belonging to the Tolkien universe, maybe the Lord of the Rings. And also, it's able to give me the source, the URL of the original picture. As a developer, one thing I like very much is, of course, I get the name uh, the, of the web entity, GRL Tolkien, but better, I get an entity ID. So I, I, have, an, I have an ID uh, to identify this entity, and I ca can use it in my code. So I told you it's an API, so you can do a web request to get the result. 
but you, so the developers are using languages, and you can find open source client libraries in your favorite language. So here, for instance, this is in Python. And you see the number of lines it takes uh, to do that. So you just create a, a client. You provide the content, so here a picture. You call the feature you're interested in, face detection, and you have the results that you can uh, use right away. So from the developer point of view, it's pretty interesting. Very few lines, no bug, it means no bug, and you can focus on the results and use them right away. Okay? But I've chosen examples. I very much prefer uh, live demos, so let's try with local examples from Berlin. Okay, so this is the, the browser. Um, you can try most of the APIs in your own browser. You will have the links at the end, okay? So you can just drag and drop pictures. Um, six months ago, I was here for another conference. So it was around Christmas. No, it's on the less than three six months ago. I took this picture, so I don't remember the place. Of course, I'm removing all the metadata from the pictures. They are not used by default, but just to make sure. Um, so there's no GPS location in this picture. But still, it's able to recognize the Reich Reichstag building. Um, OK. This picture was taken at night, at winter time. So let's see uh, if we have. Why is it able to detect? the location of this picture. It's not sure about it. It's giving me a confidence score. Because someone else wrote an article with the right tag, and OK, this one is similar. Maybe I have a closer one. But you see, it's based on image detection. It's able to recognize very similar pictures. Let's try something else. Um, OK, let's try this one. So this one I took from the hotel this morning. I was uh, curious about the results. So it's telling me it's a sculpture, pretty sure about it. It's about art, it's a statue. Better, it's a bronze sculpture. And there's, there are arms, hands, and legs, so everything is correct. Um, yeah, nothing famous about it. Let's see the... Um, the close pictures. Okay, I might get funny results, so I'm taking a risk here. Oh, okay. Pretty nice. So you see, of course, so I guess it's in a museum, but it's very close. So it's a sculpture in metal, in bronze, uh, and very close. The legs, the arms, and the head are about at the same location. So very, very interesting. So it means you can gather a lot of knowledge from one source. Maybe you can find other insights from other sources. So let's try something else. So of course, this picture I did not take. I got it from the web. But I changed it. I zoomed in, cropped it, and changed. I applied a filter to make it very, very vivid. So it's telling me that there's a face, very uh, joyful face. Cool. Uh, not many labels, but there's a smile. It's an official person, right? And if I check the entities, it's telling me that most probably this is Angela Merkel and, uh, yeah, the right ch chancellor of Germany. Cool. So you see, uh, a lot of insight can, get, can be uh, extracted from the pictures, but also from the web. This picture is to show you something specific. You can also uh, no, so it's telling me that there's a face that is surprised. Um, maybe a zombie, it's a fictional character, there's a face and so on. But if I query for safe search, so for features in this picture, it will tell me that possibly this is a violent picture. So it means I can also tr maybe try, uh, try to filter uh, my input, thanks to this information. Okay. But... Uh, this is still some me putting the pictures uh, in the model. So I would, get, I would like you to participate in a live demo uh, altogether. So I've done this small demo with, you've heard the serverless term, so with serverless technologies. So what I've done is I have created for, uh, uh, buckets. So buckets are cloud 
our folders in the cloud. I have created three Python functions here. And you're going to be able to take selfies here. It will upload the selfie in this bucket. It will automatically trigger the Python function with the selfie. I will call the vision API. I will store the result. And then I will do some composition based on the results. OK? So I propose you to take your smartphones. This is uh, the demo is called Stash Club. Uh, if you remember, eight, uh, five club, there are eight rules. But here, there's only one. If it's your first time at Stash Club, you must get your mustache. OK? OK, so, so here, for instance, this is the first bucket where your pictures will be uploaded. Let me start by inviting a few guests. OK. OK, it works. And then you can connect your phones with this QR code or, or with this URL, bit.ly slash cityberlin19, city for code talks, code talks Berlin, cityberlin19. Yeah, I'll give you a moment to get connected. And so you will still have the URL. So you should reach a page like this. OK, the URL is still here if you need to enter it. There will be three live demos in the presentation. So when it's done, keep your browser open. We will move on. OK, so let's move to step one of the demo. If you refresh the page, you can enter a nickname. And then it will ask you whether you're OK to use the camera of your smartphone. Of course, if you're not comfortable, don't do it. But it might be fun. We might, we might see you on the screen also, right? OK, so let's move on. And let me check Yeah, So I am in the machine learning API mode. So you can try to upload a selfie and try to express an emotion, try to be happy, try to be surprised, try to be angry, try to be sad, OK? I'm going to, to do likewise with you. Uh, OK? Don't make fun of me. And so, so you see, yeah. So as I have the location of the nose and mouth, I can add a mustache to everyone. And also here, it's telling me that it's very confident that I'm surprised, which, which is correct. And let's try something else. Hey. And yeah, joyful. OK, I didn't manage to catch my mustache, but it's OK. And I look like my father with a mustache. OK, so let's see what you've been doing. You can try as many times as, as, you, as you like. Hungry. So that was Wolverine I invited at the beginning. Only Wolverine is angry. Nobody's sad. Do we have anyone surprised? Myself? Yeah. A few of you. Yeah, it works. And also, so the zombie. The zombie, if you remember, it, it told me that the zombie was possibly violent. So I was able to blur the zombie picture on the fly. So I filtered it kind of out. OK. Oh, we have, sorry, we have a new one. OK. Cool. Uh, anyone happy? Yeah, it works. OK. Angela is here. She's, she's happy. Oh, here, uh, here there's a mistake. You see, I would say you're angry. But actually, it, it, it said that you're more happy than angry. So, so here, it's not perfect. You see the results? Uh, what's interesting? So here, for instance, you are uh, sticking your tongue out. I have a picture of, uh, is it here? No, I missed it. Or is it coming? Let me check. Yeah, and of course, you always have to remember it's able to detect something, but in other cases, it has to tell you. Uh, OK, so here we have some people sticking their tongues out. This is something I would like to detect. And my first reaction was with Einstein. I wanted to detect the fact that as Einstein has his tongue out. So we will see that with AutoML a bit later. OK. So you see it works. Uh, it's only a few lines of code. So this is the actual first Python function I wrote. As you can see, I'm preparing the data, uh, describing the buckets. And I'm asking for face detection and for safe search detection. So this is why I, I'm able to know the, the zombie is violent. 
and this is how I get uh, your face information. See, only these lines to, to get all the information. Okay, so let's move on. You've seen it's very easy. Uh, video intelligence API. So it's a lot like the, the vision API, the vision model, but with another dimension, time. So you can do pretty much the same, or with time you will be able to do the same. Uh, well, there, there are many, many new features coming uh, along. But also, so in a video, you, you can know which sequences are detected. So you can know if you, are, you have kids in a video, but where, in which sequences. So e the easiest way is to show you uh, also a demo of that. So this is a video that has been indexed with the video intelligence model. And here are the labels I'm getting. So you see, uh, and the different sequences. So for instance, it, it's telling me that there's a spiral galaxy at the beginning. The world is made with tiny bits. That's correct. Uh, there are humans. With invisible stuff. In particular, correct. enormous. And like correct. Cool. And what do we have to? Uh, a polar bear here. You will fix something. Yeah, that's correct. So you see, it's almost the same, but on a video. You can do that, that in batch mode, but also in streaming mode. So this is uh, coming, and you, you can do that in real time uh, very soon. So pictures, videos, it, this is something that we couldn't do uh, decades ago, or it didn't work at all. Now it works pretty well, thanks to mach machine learning. A new model, natural language. So this is a big field called NLP, Natural Language Processing. This is at the heart of all systems with humans uh, interacting with us. Uh, this is why we have assistants now. We can chat with them uh, with the keyboard, and you will see also with speech a bit later on. If we are able to understand the language we're speaking, uh, the sentences we are uh, giving, uh, then we are able to understand uh, the human in front of us. And so, first of all, if you give this sentence, for instance, it will tell you first this is English, okay, but also it will give you the type and nature of all the items in the sentence and the relationships with, between them. Also, a small fact, uh, you have the lemmas. So, for instance, the verb was is actually the verb to be, and so you can work with the canonical form of uh, the different items. Pretty cool from the developer point of view. With the same sentence, like in pictures, you can recognize entities. So entities, actually, there, there, there are a few thousands of entities, and the, the, the entities that are detected are mapped to these different classes. So for instance, here with this sentence, I'm getting three different groups. The first one in red are persons. So Tolkien is a person, that's right. By the way, if you notice, I'm getting an ID here, and it's the same as when I had an ID, uh, as I, uh, when I had a picture of Tolkien. It's the same ID. So I know that here we are talking about Tolkien, the same one that wa who was in the picture before. Likewise, British is mapped to a location relating to the United Kingdoms. And the three books at the end are detected as works of art, mapped to works of art. Cool. Likewise, this same sentence can be, can be classified. And it would be classified under books and literature, 97% sure about it. Everything is perfectly correct. And finally, like in pictures, it can try to detect sentiments. So to try it, I took two different reviews, one from the New York Times and one from uh, a social book net network, a book social network, sorry. Uh, the first one is very positive, the, the second one is very negative. I input all the different sentences, and what I'm getting are ratings. So I'm getting a score between minus one and plus one, and it works. Uh, at the top, I have the positive sentences from the New York Times. At the bottom, I have the sentences from Pauline, who didn't like the book at all. And of course, in between, you can have neutral sentences. Okay. And if you want to use that with your own um, language, then a few, few lines are needed, you see? 
still the same. You have a client to communicate with the cloud solution. You provide the content and you call. Here, this is analyze sentiment. You call the feature that you want. OK, so that was about text analysis, right? Likewise, with text, sometimes it's not in the right language for us, so you can translate it. So I won't get into many details. I'm sure I would bet everyone here has used Google Translate at least once. Sure. Um, before joining Google, uh, I noticed something. So that was about four years ago. I was using it, of course, with French uh, text and to to check the English tr translation. And at some point, there was something weird. It, w it worked OK, it was good. But at some point, it went v to be very good. The results were a lot better. And what I learned is that this is when actually Google switched from a mainly statistical model to a purely machine learning model. Uh, and, and the machine learning model, as I said, is learning all the time. So this is why it's working uh, so much better and learning all the time. OK? OK, so you see here just two lines to get a translation. So like before, I propose you to, to test that in a live demo. So you can take again your browser. And I've added two uh, calls in my back end. So you're going to be able to send me, to text me, right, from your smartphone. If the text is not in English, I will translate everything to English so you can try your linguistic skills. And I will run a text analysis on the results uh, live. OK? So let's move to step two. If you refresh the page, uh, again, sorry, I have a small bug. So you refresh twice. You can tell me anything. I will write uh, something uh, in French. My German is too rusty. OK, so you can text me, and we're going to check that. Uh, let me also send a few sample sentences. in different languages. Oops. OK. So let's see what we have, the different messages. So we have angry people, uh, I would know. Uh, so this is, yeah, OK, well, um, I don't want to say this is not Arabic. Ursi, maybe something like that. Yeah, is it right, Ursi? German. Uh, there are new languages, I don't know, SQ, I don't know which language this is. Uh, Chinese, so the Chinese, uh, Bulgarian, Jap or maybe Russian, uh, Japanese, uh, Czech, Lebanese, I guess. Yeah, is it right? German, and someone tried to, do, to make some injection. <laughs> so the first time I did the demo, actually, it was not protected, and, and it worked. <laughs> uh, what have you been talking about? Berlin, the German language, Dusseldorf, Google, Krusty Krab, OK, IDLO, Lander. So you see, uh, so this is results you can uh, have right away. And what are your sentiments? So positive ones, thank you. Cool, cool. So I love raspberries, that's me. Of course, best programmers come from Dusseldorf. I heard that there are very good ones in Berlin and Hamburg and elsewhere. Uh, well, OK, thank you. So you see, positive ones. Never called alone. I agree. Peace be, OK. OK, and negative ones. Berlin is too big for it, yeah? A little bit negative. So this is not really negative. And this is very negative. So of course, this is not perfect. You have confidence scores and so on. So you still have to be careful, but you can have a lot of insight uh, from that. OK, so let's move on. OK, so we've seen pictures, videos, text. What you can do, you can do likewise with speech. So you can convert speech to text and text to speech. OK, so this is not a new field, but before it was processed without machine learning. The results were OK, um, but once again, we managed this level of quality thanks to machine learning. So for instance, if you're able to 
transcribe speech to text, it means you can index all of your audio streams and know the exact location of all the words in your speech. Okay, so let's try a demo. So here it will be right away in the browser. It's here. Okay, I'm okay to use the microphone. What is the temperature in Berlin? It's 17 degrees in Berlin right now. So what's interesting, first it works, but it's real time. So machine learning didn't used to be real time, right? It was working in batch mode with a long response time. So here this is real, real time. And it's also giving you the results as soon as possible, uh, even temporary results. When I started to say what is the temperature in Ber it gave me one word, but Eventually, when I finished my sentence, it corrected it, all right? And it works. Uh, let me try it. I don't know if it will work. What is the temperature in Paris? It's nine degrees okay. in Paris right Even now. with a different accent, it worked. So it's pr pretty amazing. Uh, with an algorithm, it wouldn't work because, because it would learn on actual, uh, you know, actual phonemes. Okay. So the opposite, text-to-speech. So also, this is not uh, new. Uh, I've worked with text-to-speech engines uh, in 2000. I was very proud. So in the first, this first ebook device, I included a text-to-speech engine. So you would have a read-aloud features. You would press play. It would synchronize all the words and would read the, the book aloud to you. I was very, very proud. Uh, a lot of work. I pushed the firmware update, and nobody used the feature. So that was 2001, uh, but it's obvious. Uh, at, the, at the time, it was a robotic voice uh, reading the book aloud, right? So it doesn't work. As of today, it works because uh, this is very human-like a voice. And at Google, so there's this WaveNet technology. It has been developed by DeepMind in London. Maybe you know them from AlphaGo or AlphaStar. So they've been able to learn from scratch how to play chess. Now they're trying to beat uh, StarCraft uh, gaming champions. And so they know what they're doing. They've written a few articles, if you're interested. And WaveNet is pretty amazing. This is the most advanced machine learning model, I would say, for human quality. They, in one second, they are able to generate 20 seconds of speech. So this is better than real time. And this is very human-like. So those are two samples. Sociology at Columbia University. She earned a doctorate in sociology at Columbia University. So one is the original one, and the other one has been generated just by writing the same sentence. They are very much alike. It's very hard to tell the difference. And the only way I could really hear the difference is by putting in-ear uh, 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 speakers. And, and then I can hear the difference. But with this voice, it's pretty amazing, okay. And this is why we have assistants right now, because it's very pleasant to, we can speak to them, they will, they will understand, transcribe our, vo our voice to text, which will be understood, and then they can speak back to us. Okay, so we've seen what you can do with APIs. So APIs, they are ready to use models. But in some cases, it will not be enough for you, right? Those are pretty generic models. So this is where cloud uh, AutoML solutions are interesting. You, the only work you have to do is to provide a data set. You provide your own data, and it will, AutoML techniques will build your own model. They will, it will train it to you automatically, deploy it, and as a result, you will have an API, right? It will work the same way. You will have an API, but this time, this is a private API just for you with your own data. This is fully private. So how does it work? Um, as of today, so it's been about one year now, it's still in beta. You can use images and text as input, and from that you will get custom classification or even custom translation. You can do your own translation if you're not ha happy with the result you're getting today. Let me give you a precise example. So if you're using these two pictures with the Vision API, it will give you the same results. It will tell you, basically, that those are clouds in the sky, which is OK. It's correct. 
But if you want more precise results, like knowing this is a Cyrus at the top and an alto cumulus at the bottom, then you can use AutoML. And for that, you can prepare a data set. So you just need pictures, you label them. You say, this is an alto cumulus, this is a cumulus, and so on. Ideally, you would need 1,000 pictures per label. That's the ideal case. It's not that much. So this demo was done by Sarah Robinson. Uh, she's a teammate uh, from New York. And so she used not 1,000, but about 200 pictures for each label. And then she launched her first training of one hour only. Uh, so one hour distributed is actually 15 minutes. She got some results, 85% uh, accuracy. And she fixed a few mistakes, so like a bad label for one picture. And then she launched another training of three compute hours, and she reached 92% of accuracy. One of the tools to, to know whether it works or not is the confusion ma matrix. So you can see here that we are very good with cumulonimbuses, 100% accuracy on the test set. But we are very bad at the bottom with the alto stratuses. We are confusing it for something else uh, half of the time. Okay, so it means we have to work on our data set and provide more pictures or better pictures. I tested it with it's a picture I took from in Poland. It works. It's a cumulus. It works. Okay. Uh, okay, I will skip that. I will maybe talk about it with the questions after. So I propose to take you again to try it uh, with the live demo to take you again your smartphones and. We're going to go back to step one, but in auto ML mode this time. And I told you I wanted to detect I wanted to detect something else. So I want to detect people with their tongues out, okay? People yawning, oh, I'm tired, and people sleeping, very tired, okay? So you can try th these three uh, emotions or face expressions or anything else, and, uh, and we will see the results. So let's try to... Ooh, yo. Oh, this is lunch break, almost. Okay, so everything is um, with serverless uh, technology, so it means it will upscale. I, I can be alone, we can be 100, we can be 1000. It will scale up automatically. So here it works, it told me uh, I'm yawning, uh, very high confidence. You can share the pictures on Twitter if you, if you, are, if you like. Um, let's try something else. Uh, yeah. Okay, you can do that to me, of course. Okay, it works. And tongues out. Of course, it has been trained with pictures of me, so it works better with me, but should work with you too, uh, despite the light, I hope. And let's try to sleep. Okay, let's see the results. Tongue out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, even an uninvited, uninvited guest. So you see that works pretty well. Actually, I use one picture of uh, of uh, Donald Trump, but as a test picture, not as a training picture. So two of us are yawning. Sleeping people, it works very well. I use also about 200 pictures uh, for each label. Uh, let's see everything else. Okay, so that was from before. Tongues, yawning, sleeping, and everything else. Do we have... Okay, so this one, there's a mistake here. You really have your tongue out. So this is where I should improve my training set, right? I would need... So this is here, this is not detected. So this is a uh, false negative, right? Um, I will p my, my slides are published, so you will be able to see that later. Um, I'm running out of time. So uh, if you don't know about true positives and so on, um, you will have the explanation. Quickly, uh, there are three techniques. There are three techniques uh, under the hood for AutoML. They are known uh, by the experts, uh, two of them. Uh, transfer learning is the first one. So we are reusing existing neural networks, we, I mean the experts, and building new layers with your own data. So this is called transfer learning, and I guess this is how we all learn. We have some knowledge, personal knowledge, and when we see something new, we are able to build something new and learn something additional. 
Something very specific maybe to Google is machine learning for machine learning, so it's consuming a lot of computing power. So this is why we have dedicated hardware called TPU tensor processing units. And it is exploring a lot of different architectures and selecting the best one that will give the right results, but also in the minimum time. And when it has found that, and when you have the training set, it will also find the right tunings for the hyperparameters. So this is also uh, something that humans, that experts were doing, fine tuning by hand these parameters. There are algorithms now that are able to do better uh, than experts. Uh, and yeah, the example is, for instance, uh, experts would find this optimal value for parameters, but actually the best one is here. And this is now this can be found uh, with uh, these techniques. OK. So we've seen how you can use generic models, how you can build your own models with AutoML solutions. If you want to become an expert, you can do more machine learning, of course. There are many frameworks. TensorFlow is one of them. It's open source. It's the most popular uh, machine learning repo on GitHub. And uh, how does it work? So you can set it up on your laptop. You can build, you can design. Of course, there are many tutorials. You can design your own neural networks. So if you want to do something new, if you want to innovate, you can actually become an expert with that. Maybe with a lot of data, you will need weeks to train, uh, to train the model on your laptop, even desktop. And so there are cloud solutions like Cloud Machine Learning Engine, where you can actually train in the cloud. It will go from weeks to days or even hours. So you can save a lot of time. And then you can also deploy uh, the model later on in the cloud. OK, so time to wrap up. We've seen a lot how you can use APIs, how you can be your model, but you can also become an expert if you would like. If I was in my 20s, I would try to become an expert. I am not an expert, I'm just a developer. You can find uh, the slides at this URL if you're interested. Feel free to send me any feedback. Uh, I'm just speaking, uh, pretty, still pretty new to the scene uh, for two years now. I hope you learned a few uh, things today. Uh, ideally, I hope it gave you a few ideas. Uh, thank you a lot for having me today. And if you have some questions, I'm here, and I will be around for the lunch break also. Any questions? Uh, I'm not really seeing you, so feel free to speak up. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, I wanted to uh, how do you handle overfitting for the auto ML? If you have such a small training samples, how do you avoid uh, overfitting in the model? Yeah, I, as you could understand, I'm not an expert, so I, I, I don't have the answer. <laughs> That's the magic for me, not for you, I'm sorry. But I, I, I've heard, I know what over overfitting is, but I don't know how it, it is handled with uh, machine learning, ah. uh, with auto ML. Uh, what I guess is that um, there are, for instance, if you provide a very similar uh, imp uh, input in the data set, maybe, uh, for instance, if you provide the same pictures in the data set, it will tell you that there's an issue because if you're trying to input the same picture, it, it doesn't work, doesn't make any sense. But if we pr you provide very similar pictures, then you might reach a case where it will Bi uh, it will not overfit, but it, it will give a bias in, into your model. So this is also something right now that you have to be aware of to try to be balanced with your data set. Uh, I'm not answering your questions, I know, uh, about, about overfitting. But what I can do is I give you my card. I will check with experts uh, at Google and we'll give you the answer in a couple of days. Okay? Nice. Thanks. Any other questions? Not uh, expert questions. <laughs> Okay, I will take a selfie in, in, in the meantime. Hi, um, I have a quick question about this identifier. You talked 
Um, is this something like a Google database behind it? Where are you? Sorry. Here. Hi. Okay. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, actually, so yeah, this is uh, pretty interesting. Uh, actually, this ID is a knowledge based ID. I was uh, very curious about it too. As you know, Google has been crawling the web for 20 years. And to understand what was in web pages, uh, there's a team for that. Uh, they had to create these web entities. So a web entity has an ID, and Google has built a big knowledge base. And so this ID is coming from the Knowledge Base API. So this is something that you can use. Uh, and and the, the, the tough challenges they are meeting is to actually have one unique ID, right? Uh, if you have a, a web page about uh, GRL Tolkien and another web page about Christopher Tolkien, the son, you're not talking about the same entity, right? And at first, if you're just basically crawling the two pages, then you would say, okay, this is Tolkien and this is Tolkien. The same ID, yeah, but it doesn't work like that. So the tough challenges they had to, to, to overcome is to actually uh, merge uh, temporary IDs and, and have this big knowledge base. Uh, you, you can try it if you, you're interested, and it works with everything. Everything is using that. And also they have integrated the Wikipedia pages because here you can consider that one Wikipedia page is one identifier of something, right? So in those cases, either you get a something related to the Wikipedia page or something related to the knowledge base uh, from Google. Yeah, does it answer your question? Thank you uh, for the talk. Um, you just. Uh, um um, passed through a couple of uh, slides, um, apparently using um, uh, um, companies using your your APIs, like um, fashion industries, urban out outfitters. Can you just maybe give an example how they use it? Yeah, uh, thank you for asking the question. Um, okay, let's have a look at that. So, as I said, AutoML is still pretty new. It's in beta right now, but there are companies using it in production. And one of them I've been able to talk to, uh, it's called ZSL. Uh, so I didn't talk to ZSL, but I talked to Datatonic, the company that developed a solution for them. They are using AutoML Vision in production. So ZSL is uh, the Zoological uh, Society of London. It's a charity, and they are trying to preserve uh, wildlife around the world. So what they're doing is they're putting cameras in the forest, so for instance, 50 cameras over six months in a forest. And the cameras, whenever there's uh, movement or heat, they take a picture. Over six months, it's, al it's around half a million of pictures. And up until now, they would take the cameras back after a six-month campaign, and they would still need six months of labeling each picture. So it's been a lot of work. So they have, when they put the cameras, they have to wait one year before getting the results. And in one year, uh, one species uh, could die or could, could move to another place. And they still need six months to, to actually take the pictures, but now they can do the last part of the six months in a matter of days, in less than a week. And so they've been reusing all the pictures they've labeled so far so there are lots of empty pictures, so that, that can be detected with the standard vis vision API. But with AutoML vision, they've been able, you know, you see, to label uh, subspecies, like a uh, horse tail squirrel, so very specific species, not just an elephant or a, gi a giraffe. And now they're saving months uh, of, of work with AutoML vision. So this is still be that, they will, they will have more features uh, in the future, but they, they are still saving months of work uh, thanks to that. And just to give you uh, an example, this is the confusion matrix they have right now, or they had uh, around Christmas, Christmas time, uh, with different subspecies. Thank you. Another question? Thank you for the talk. I just was uh, thinking about this freaky idea that somebody may fake my voice. So how do you personally think about 
uh, the future of this technology? Yeah, so I'm not talking on behalf of Google, right? I'm, this is just my personal point of view. Uh, I find it also creepy that th the technology is there and anyone can reproduce, reproduce your voice. Uh, anyone, any expert can reproduce your voice. Any expert can also even make a video where you will be there saying something that you never said, right? And it will be very hard to, to tell the difference. So my fear is that if bad people use this kind of technology, the fake news issue we have right now is just going to get worse, right, with time. But uh, what I like uh, with the company I work for is that last year we started to talk about ethics for real, for serious. Uh, I hope that in Europe, so some governments like Germany, France, um, start also to have committees about AI ethics, but this is there, right? So we have to, to move faster. And one thing we did great in Europe is the GDPR um, uh, agreement. So I hope we will have a similar agreement regarding AI. Uh, and what basically we have to define are the boundaries we don't want to cross. Okay, what, what is the red line uh, or yellow line, depending on the countries. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy that big companies uh, are most of the time trustful and, and uh, we can rely on them, uh, but uh, re governments really have to work on that, other otherwise medium and small companies, they, they will do whatever they want, or, or other, go other countries also will do that. Does it uh, answer your question? Any other question? I hear hungry stomaches, yeah? So it's lunchtime. Thanks a lot.